Welcome to Ear Biscuits, I'm Link. And I'm sick. <laughs> this week at the round table of dim lighting, you'll have to be listening to me speak like this, and you know what, did I bring my tissues in? I didn't even bring my freaking oh, tissues. Oh gosh. Can, can you, can somebody help please get the tissues? There's a tissue box in our office, which I've been carrying around with myself all day. Be careful with the dogs, you let the dogs out. Don't let the dogs out. This week at the Round Table of Dim Lighting, we are going to get Rhett's tissues and hopefully minimize him talking. Because the more- Minimize me talking. Yeah, because the more you talk, the more I can tell you're sick and the more you're spewing stuff into my no, radius. No, no, no. I have been purposely d directing it away from you all day. I'm currently speaking out of the right side of my mouth so it all goes to one side of the Can room. you face that way? Are you cool with that? No, I'm projecting everything to this side. But also face that way. Thank you, Kiko. Look at that, got my tissue box. I'm sitting um, right there. Today, we're gonna update you and each other on the spring break adventures we have. We're two spring breakers. Yeah. We're not over 40. We are still go on spring break with our children. Right. Um, so yeah, we had a full week off that uh, we have not fully downloaded to each other. I mean, it's in from calendar time, it's the distant past, but in relational time, it's like yesterday. Yeah, it's been a- It's yesterday, brother. A week and a half or so. Uh, we do wanna let you know that your boys have been nominated for a couple of Webbies for your favorite, or at least the podcast you're listening to right now, Ear Biscuits. Yes, we are a Webby nominee in podcasts, best host, which I think is me, but, um, but uh, you know- No, I think, <laughs> I think that's me. Oh, really? Yeah, it, it actually said in parentheses, uh, the shorter one. So you can go to. The funnier one. If you wanna vote for me or Link for best host. No. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're they don't have together. A best, they don't have a best host. We're not competing. Category. You shouldn't make us com compete against each other. We're competing against no, no, other no. people. No, the whole idea is that people compete against, they, we, we compete against each other to generate more votes for us collectively because what we're not telling everybody is that a vote for me is a vote for us and a vote for you is a vote for us. So uh, vote twice. You can vote because there's an audience choice and we want you to choose us. Vote.webbyawards.com through April 18th, 2019. But that was just one of the nominations, Link. The other nomination was just best podcast in the comedy category. Yeah, very honored. Thank you, Webbies, for the nomination. Um, well, listen, we don't have much control over the judges' choices, but we can encourage you to vote. We are part of the Academy. Vote.webbyawards.com. And we will be voting for ourselves. Look only for ear biscuits. And uh, GMM can is also do, can nominated. You do that? Can you vote for yourself? GMM is nominated for variety series, comedy, and I think, is that all we got? We got an honor. Host. GMM hosts, we got an honorable mention. Yeah, yeah. So no, there's, not good, we're not we good enough hosts of GMM to nope. be a nominee, but we are good enough to be an honoree. And all, all we do is go on vacations and come back and talk about it. <laughs> I mean, and then you call it comedy. That's right. It's the new comedy. Hold on, you know what, that's a great. You think it's better than Hold that? On. That's not what you call it, Feldman? Sorry, go on sorry, sorry to touch don't your touch sleeve. It. Don't touch sorry, my sleeve. Sorry to touch your sleeve. We're gonna have to desanitize it. But you it. just actually. Well, sanitize it. You gave me and us. A quarter? An idea for what the future of this podcast could be. Let's just be travel buddies and just talk about our travels. Yeah. Okay, can can we go separate? <laughs> because if because we go together, there's nothing to talk about. You're right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I see where you're going with that. Can we be we, estranged we, travel we, buddies? We go, we're not travel buddies, we're travel correspondents. You need to raise your mic a little bit. I think Smosh yeah. has been using your mic stand and you're hunching. You're not supposed to tell people that Smosh re records their podcast in here. And late. you're gonna make them sick. Yeah, that's my goal, make Smosh sick. That's not strategic for us. I'm just gonna be honest. Um, so I went back to London for uh, spring break and we took, I had this idea in January, maybe maybe it was the end of last year. I had this idea when, because Lily, our oldest uh, daughter, our oldest child is turning 16. Well, she just did, March 31st, she turned 16 um, and I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool to just take her on a vacation, just us, me, Christy, and her? So it's not a family vacation, this is like a dedicated time to just make it special for her at such a special 
point in your life. I mean, they call it sweet 16. For a reason. Well, question mark. So I would like to explore at some point how sweet it was. There were a couple of acute sour points, which I will oh, get into. Exciting. Um, and it's that, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm still processing. Allow me to process with you. So I will give some uh, London recommendations on my second trip there in, in, in just a, a number of weeks. And I will use those. Uh, and I, uh, of course, went to a different part of the world, closer, I went to Colorado and skied and had some harrowing experiences there. Wouldn't say I almost died, at least you not that I. You had heroin in Vail. It, it, at least not as, uh, uh, I didn't come as close to death as, I mean, you know, sometimes you never know how close you got to death. I mean, maybe I just missed death, but I, I embarrassed myself in a big way a well, couple again, of times. Again, we will know when we die and watch the footage back right? how close you came to death. Uh, I don't know if I'll be there though. Travel, estranged travel buddies, we're not gonna die at the same time. That's the, new, that's the name of the, estranged travel buddies is the name of the other podcast. Uh, I do wanna tell you about another travel thing that happened to me uh, just two days ago. So, um, do it. For those of you who read the uh, Book of Mythicality uh, or came to the Tour of Mythicality, you know the story uh, that I tell about my wife's grandmother, Gaga, uh, and her integral and sort of f very funny role in our relationship of emailing back and forth. Well, you should tell a truncated version. Basically, she had an email address back in the 90s when I was getting to know Jesse and Jesse did not, so I literally emailed her grandmother who would then print out the emails and then send them to Jesse. Because you were in Slovakia. Because I was in a different place. And I, t I tell that story in, uh, in the Book of Mythicality and, and on the tour. But anyway, Gaga at the age of 94 passed away last week. Uh, well, a little, a little more than a week ago. I was sad to hear that. And uh, we went home for- a Great woman. A memorial service. And I already knew that she was an incredible woman. I knew that she was, and I, like I told you, that like she was like strangely great, like unusually unusual. You know, like she had all, you know, she kind of fit the typical older Southern lady uh, in a certain number of ways, but she also was just in the things Southern. that you would. She would say like Southern. She, she dropped her R's. Like that. Yeah, yeah, Southern. it was like that old Southern Belle kind of thing. But like something is up in the air. You know, that's yeah. she literally talked like that, and she was hey, not joking. Yeah, this old Raleigh accent. But as we told stories about her, we just it, 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 all these things came back to. Was that the ceremony, like a storytelling? Yeah, it was literally. We just that's all cool. got together at her daughter's house, my mother-in-law, and we just told stories about her. And she, we all wore white. She was like, "I don't want y'all to wear black. I want you to wear white." because uh, it's a celebration. I lived 94 years. And uh, so anyway, it, it was, there was lots of laughs, lots of funny stories about Gaga, lots of tears at the same time. But anyway, I had to make a very quick trip to North Carolina for the weekend. Um, took the red eye on Friday night. Uh, there's actually an airport in New Bern. Yeah. Which is not too far from where your wife grew up. Down east. And um, that's a lot closer, because it was actually at my in-laws beach house is where we ha had the ceremony. So I was like, well, this is a quick trip. I I'm gonna fly directly to New Bern and, and then and rent a car and go down to the beach house. And I was gonna fly on Friday, I flew on Friday night. We sh we filmed all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, we, we, we were shooting GMM and uh, some other things on Friday. And so we went pretty late. So I took that red eye, which incidentally was one of the red eyes where I was hoping that it was gonna, I was gonna have a little bit more room, but I basically just sat in an upright position and tried to sleep, which was not fun. It's not fun for a big man to have to do that. Tell that to a horse. I believe it's one of the reasons that I got sick because I didn't get a lot of sleep and I was already getting sick. Anyway, um, beautiful ceremony on uh, Saturday and then Sunday we're gonna go back and of course we have to go to the New Bern Airport then you t take the flight from New Bern to Charlotte, North Carolina. Like a puddle jumper situation? I mean, it wasn't, it, yeah, it was a small small plane. Bigger than I anticipated, but still pretty small. You know, one one row of seats and then two rows, well, yeah. one column of seats and then two columns of seats on each side of the plane. And uh, so we get to the New Bern Airport, which incidentally is like two gates and there, there are 
like a strip mall type it situation? It looks like you're pulling into a retirement home. Oh, that's even what, better. That's what the airport is like. Like literally the rental car drop off is just a parking lot and it's for all the companies. And then when you go inside, the every no matter what the rental car company is, you deal with the Alamo person. So like there's a sign on the enterprise thing that says, we're out, please talk to Alamo. <laughs> and oh, so, wow. like the, so like they got one employee like handling all the rental cars. There's rocking chairs in the airport, which incidentally there's rocking chairs in the Charlotte airport. But really? it's much more quaint in the Newburn Airport, which I think is Sounds called the like, Coastal Carolina Regional Airport. Are you sure you weren't flying out of a Cracker Barrel? <laughs> it was as much like a Cracker Barrel as an airport can be. Okay. So we. It, I hope to be successful enough to park my private plane at Cracker Barrel. It's so small that you don't just get there and then go through security. You get there and you sit outside, and then right before your plane takes off, they're like, "Okay, everybody, go through security." Wow. Then you go through security and just basically get on the plane. Like that's how small it is. So Locke and I get there. I got there like an hour before the flight, which is very late for me typically. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm at like a 1.5 to two hours ahead of time, but I knew and, that and we didn't you're, have you're a lot to deal a, with. An anxious wreck. And uh, I get there an hour early, and then I realize that the flight has been delayed by 30 minutes, which is gonna give us about 30 minutes to make our connection. Like from the time the Ooh. doors, we, we, we touch down in Charlotte, we got about 30 minutes before they shut the door to the other. So I'm a little anxious, so anything could go wrong here. Mm -hmm. Sitting there waiting, and then the flight gets delayed. No, we get onto the, onto the runway. And the pilot says, I, unfortunate news, uh, we've been given a weather delay for, we're, we're gonna take off in approximately 30 minutes. That's not so gonna work. So basically my entire buffer yeah, it's is gone. gone. So first thing I do. stayed in that rocking chair. First thing I do, because I have become basically totally dependent on people helping me do things at this point in my <laughs> life, <laughs> is I text Jenna, oh, see. my assistant, our assistant. Oh gosh. And I'm like, Jenna, <laughs> Here's the situation, I actually called her, I called her, I was like, okay, we were supposed to have a buffer, we're not gonna have a buffer, and. I just, I just need a shoulder to cry on I, right now. I need you to get, the phone. I need you to get me on the next flight. I talked to the woman at the gate in New Bern preemptively and she was like, well the next flight's completely full, you could do standby or you can fly out in the morning. And I'm just thinking about the fact that I don't wanna be there, and I'm with Locke by the way, so Locke and I flew together because Jesse and Shepard were staying a couple of days extra. Locke's gotta get back to school, I gotta get back to work, we got things happening, we got things scheduled, we got meetings, et cetera. You're important enough to have an assistant. And so she, she was like, okay, I'll, I'll get on the phone with the, rep actually the representative is supposed to call me back in 50 minutes because that's what, when she called the number, they were like, to get a call back 50 minutes from now, so she did that. And that's about how long the flight takes. So we touched down, mathematically speaking, and I'd already, I had talked to the pilots, I'd gone up to the two pilots, because there were everybody sitting there with each other, and I started talking with them, I was like, you guys. Hold on, you, could see, you were sitting with the pilots? The pilots were sitting waiting to get on the plane, oh. wait, waiting to get on the plane, oh. and I was like, hey guys, uh, how confident are you in this, in this getting, you know, getting to Charlotte? And they're like younger than me, and so, and, and they were like, well, uh, you know, it'll probably be a one hour total from, you know, closing the doors to opening the doors, getting off the next plane, and they were like, "Where you got to get?" I was like, "I got a really tight connection to LAX," and they were like, "Okay, we'll do whatever we can to get there as fast as we can." Like, I don't know what kind of control they have. I thought it was all autopilot anyway. What do you think they might say? You know what? We'll just take you to Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping for I've that. I've seen you on the internet. We'll reroute the plane. I think you're nominated for a Webby. Hey, do you have an assistant? That was what I was hoping for. All right, for we're going secretly. straight to Los Angeles. I was Angeles. hoping they would secretly recognize me and make accommodations, but that didn't happen. So. Anyway, I was freaking out, as you might imagine, and then we, we, we our flight out of Charlotte was at 545. The plane lands, they, now we've been told, they close the doors 10 minutes before departure. At 535, the doors will close. We landed, we touched down on the runway at 525. It took seven minutes for them to. You got three minutes to get there. But not only that, because the plane is so small, we had to valet our bags. So we couldn't just get off the plane. We, they they had to put the plane. They had to put the bags with the tags underneath the gate. Check the bags. Okay. So how much time did you have when you got your bags? One minute. Okay. We had one minute. We got our bags at five thirty four. I'm texting Jenna. She's like, 
the gate eight, the woman says that you're not gonna make it. She's talked to the gate. They're not holding, they're not holding it for you. That's what Jenna is saying that the American Airlines woman is saying to her. So she's like, I've already got you booked on I think the next they flight. Did, I think they did know who you were. Uh, they've already got you booked on the next flight. So first of all, I looked at a map of the Charlotte airport and I was at the, all the way at the end of Terminal D and I had to go, or E, I had to go all the way down E You're and then back Jason up You're trying to Jason this thing. All the way down E and back up D. Okay. And I'm like looking at the thing, I'm like, okay, maybe I can make this. I was thinking maybe I can make this in five minutes. When I had one minute, I was already sick. Anyway, Locke and I pick up our, our carry-ons. We're, we're ca literally carrying our carry-ons and we both have backpacks. We start running. Locke's a young man. He's 15, he's in shape. He kind of gets ahead of me pretty, qu pretty quickly. Yeah. I am running as fast as I possibly can without hurting myself through the Charlotte airport. Wow saying, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, you know, as being as polite as possible, still a good Southern boy. I would've just resorted to a beep. Boop, boop, <laughs> boop. Then they just think you're backing up. They think, excuse the cart, when you do that, and then they, they get out of the way They would've slowly. looked for a cart. Um, just flying through the airport. Eventually, I had to stop and gather myself. Oh. I mean, it was that crazy. Had to take a breather, hands on the knees. Multiple times, so in, in the end, I stopped three times, and we get all the way to the gate, and I see a bunch of people lined up and I'm like, this is potentially really good news. And then the guy sees us run up, this dude is like, they changed it to six o'clock guys, no worries. Really? They moved it back 15 minutes. So they had already boarded, uh, boarded my group. But so I'm like sweating profusely. Like I've got a, a hoodie on that I've worn and ran in. Oh gosh. And. Uh, Anyway, I think that sent me even further into sickness because I just completely uh, exerted myself. That's the most I've worked out in probably a decade and it was just to run across the Charlotte airport. And you know what, I could have strolled because it was I had 15 minutes instead of one. I would have said, you know what, I'd rather not worry about this and I wouldn't have done, You know, I mean, I'm not rubbing it in, I'm just telling you, I would have not done anything. I would have been like, well, I'll get there when I get there. Well, but ironically, I would have gotten there. And the same nine time times as you. out of ten, you would have missed the flight. Oh, I, that, that's and, your opinion. And I would have missed the flight if, if they had to move the flight. If I was there, we would have gotten it. in a huge fight. I would have just got. I, no, I, I probably wouldn't have ran. I would have gotten on the plane without you. Yeah, I would. I, I probably wouldn't have ran. If I you, probably would have ran, but I would have been very angry about it. And then I would have been proven right when we got there. But if what I did got, Locke say? Was he mad? No, he was. He was excited. It was an adventure. Well, he's not 41. He didn't almost pull something or die. Uh, Kiko, could you grab that trash can so I don't have to throw Gosh. my snot-laden uh, tissues like, onto the floor? Can't, and then Jenna did all this work for nothing. Now Kiko's doing this. For, look at you, man. Look at you, man. <sighs> anyway. Can't get your own Kleenex? Can't if, get your own trash can? If, if you need the directions from gate uh, E38 to gate D10 at Charlotte, just hit me up on Twitter, that's at RhettMC. I bet you smelled horrible. <laughs> no, I smell good, no, actually. You didn't. My sweat tends to generate good good odors. Oh gosh, listen at you, man. Listen at you. <laughs> listen at you. I'm gonna share my experience and then hear, hear about yours. Uh, but first, we gotta promote some stuff, some merch. Uh, Mythical.store is where you can get all types of stuff Big and small. Here's a small thing, a pop socket that says, it's got the mythical logo on it. I got a pop That's socket our company. that has the good mythical morning logo on it. So if you want a little something like a mid, mid year stocking stuffer, like get, get the jump on stuffing that, stuffing that stocking at mythical.store. <laughs> You'll forget that it was in there. You're like, wow, I've already, listen, fill it up. Listen to that satisfying sound that a pop socket makes. Fill it halfway up. We got stickers, we got we got all types of stuff. Rep ya boys. That's what? okay, we didn't need that anymore. Yeah, sorry. <sighs> Anything else you wanna promote? We got a store on Amazon too, you can check that out. It's got different types of t-shirts. <laughs> all types of stuff happening. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think our our spring break vacations were like polar opposite because I I did something that I'm not used to doing and then this will play out, me not being used to this over the course of the specifics of my story, but um, we didn't go on what I call a vacation, we went on a sightseeing trip of London. Lily 
had the choice. She wanted to go to London. Um, I think predominantly because she's a Harry Potter fan. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I just think she's a fan of like British programming. I mean, she went through a Doctor Who phase and like the Sherlock Benedict Cumberbatch type situation. So I can't fault her for, for liking that British comedic sensibility and storytelling panache. So I was like, I'm, you know, I, I miss the whole Harry Potter boat, but I'm, I don't even. Maybe there is isn't isn't a boat. I don't know. There's probably a boat in one I don't of, think one of the stories. They, they don't have many boats in Harry Potter. I don't think yeah. they got broomsticks. You got to have a boat for something. Well, yeah, just broomsticks and a train, trains and sticks, not boats. Huh. But I'm like, you know what? This is for you. This is what. Okay, I we. We knew she was gonna choose London. I basically booked the trip. Uh, I got to Airbnb in uh, Listen Grove, which is an area of London. It's pretty centrally located, close like, to the like tube. Like Listen Grove? L-I-S-S-O-N. Oh. And um, you know, so a nice little Airbnb, a little little bed for her, and then another bedroom for me and Christy, and a full kitchen, all this type of vibe. You know, we so we got our own space. Um, but it's it was much more a sightseeing trip than a vacation, I think, because the, there's no relaxing. It's like, what are we gonna do next and what are we gonna see next? We had booked going to the Warner Brothers studio tour where they filmed all the Harry Potter movies and they have all the uh, actual props and costuming and uh, detailed set pieces and all types of things from, from all of the movies. Um, so we booked that ahead of time. On another day, we also booked uh, tickets to the stage play from the world of Harry Potter called Cursed Child, um, which I remember a couple of years back, she bought the, we bought her the script. I was like, okay, is this not the Harry Potter book? No, it's just the script. Um, so we got our hands on tickets for that. Uh, there's a two hour show and then there's a break and there's an intermission in the middle of that. And then you come back later and there's two, basically two more hours. So it's two different plays. That's a lot of play. But it's one story. So you gotta, you gotta kinda go all in. If, it if, feels about like two hours too much play for me. I was nervous. Um, Maybe 2.5 hours too much. I mean, I, I may come back to it, but I will say that having done everything that I can list out that we did, it, it was, a highlight, like I really enjoyed it. It's one of my favorite days was when we did that. We did, we saw the first the first play, first two hours, and then we took a break, walked around, we went We went to uh, Deshoom, the place that, our favorite place when we went to London. Very good. I went to a different one and it was just as amazing. I am actually calling it my favorite restaurant now. You're calling it your favorite restaurant now? Yeah, I mean it's. Better than Slug and Lettuce? Okay, yeah. <laughs> And then we went Whoa. back for the um, for the other part of it, and it was really well done. It wasn't a musical, um, which I think sidestep a bunch of potential, you know, potholes. So there's that much time. Oh, intermission such that you can eat a dinner. No, there was an intermission in the middle of the two hour play, oh. and then there were like you go out for two and a half, three hours, and then you come back and watch another two hour play. Right. So it's a it's a long break. Yeah, the intermission was just a 15 minute bathroom break in the middle of each play. Got it. Um, Two part story. Yeah, so that, I mean, day three was our studio tour. Day four was Cursed Child. So day one, just to kind of rattle off the things we did, we like took the tube to Westminster Abbey, but it was a Sunday so we couldn't get inside. I didn't realize that, so I'm like, ooh, that's my bad. It started hailing, it was cold, like literally, the. It was the only day that I saw sun the whole time I was there. It's like that is a scarce commodity in London. The s solar thing, solar ball in the sky. Solar ball in the sky. The only day I saw it, it was also hailing on me. So I had to adjust my plan instead of like going to Piccadilly Circus and we, we, we missed the changing of the guard, got hailed on, I'm like man, this is not a good start on like our first full day. And then I was like, it's too cold. We went, I was like, we gotta go into the British Museum. Saw the Rosetta Stone, which that's pretty awesome. I didn't realize that, according to what I read there at least, 
uh, maybe we didn't puff, they're puffing themselves up too much, but if it wasn't for the Rosetta Stone, we would not know how to translate Egyptian hieroglyphics, period. We also wouldn't have those great infomercials late at night yeah, about yeah. Which is why they the exist, software. right? Uh, it's it, There's three different languages on there and then each language says that, hey, this is written in two other languages. It says it, this is the same thing written in three different languages. So whichever language you read, you know that. And that's how they, that's how they um, deciphered hieroglyphics. I also, also saw like one of the Easter Island dudes, they just got sitting in there. The British. That was pretty cool. The British have had a tendency to just go places and steal things and then bring them back to their museums. There's nothing British in the British Museum. <laughs> I mean, there's like hunks of the Parthenon. <laughs> it was awesome. But it, yeah, you do the, get this weird feeling and like, I, I, I heard people joking about it, like, uh, you know, about how nothing there is is British, and I guess I mean I stole that joke, which wasn't that great. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I got this joke from the people at the museum. <laughs> nothing there in the British Museum is British. Um, we were there for like an hour, and then we ended up going. We went on the London Eye, the big Ferris wheel. Yeah. Chrissy didn't do that. You know, you're developing a, a flavor profile in my wife. She doesn't like to fly, but she did it. She conquered her fear. It was a long flight. She conquers her fear every single time she flies. So. Big ups to Christy, but she did not elect to go on the London Eye. Um, and I wasn't gonna you choose your battles, that wasn't it. Christy now, and I, 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 Lily and I did that. Well, when when you talk about these things, you need to tell me, you need to give me the, I recommend that, or I don't recommend that, because I'm gonna, uh, I, I'm gonna be in London in August, and I, you know. I recommend the, the British Museum. Um, I wouldn't do the top 10 audio tour, because they kinda send you, around at every part of the museum, and that's what we did. It was very cool, so we kinda got a whirlwind tour, but I, I would recommend that you look at the at the types of things that you're interested in and just choose one or two and go there instead of trying to do the top 10 because there were things that I weren't quite as interested in even though uh, just for the sake of them wanting to take me around the whole museum. Um, if you want a, a good place to eat in Shoreditch, we ended up that first night at a place called Gloria um, which had amazing pizza, like really good pizza, really good vibe. Um, I think there's one in Paris, and then they just opened this one in London. And do you meet Gloria? No, but they had uh, records playing, and like the ceiling was mirrored. It was it was it was really cool. It was, uh, downstairs was awesome. Should, is is the London Eye worth it, or is it? Nah, I, I don't it think so. It doesn't I went feel at night. worth it to I me. went at night, it didn't feel worth it. I, I, I don't think it's worth it. I can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine what it feels it, like, it's, what it's, it looks like. It's very slow, it's not, ah, you know. It's not the zipper. It's missable. Um, it's not the ring of fire. And then on day two, we get up, I'm like, all right, you know, we got our oyster card from the tube. I'm like, we gotta get back on the tube. I think what Christy didn't tell me was that but part of the fear of flying is like the confi the confined space type situation. So she wasn't really in love with the tube either. And you know, I, I'm definitely not criticizing her because it's. I mean, there's some there's some there's some actual anxiety going on in there. It's like something that like I don't experience, so it's it's hard for me to empathize. And uh, but I'm definitely not gonna fall for the trap of making fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. I, then I will. <laughs> but <laughs> but. Um, so I'm like, all right, let's get back on the tube. We're gonna go to the Tower of London. You know, we, we got the Harry Potter stuff. Just hold out, we'll get there tomorrow. Let's just get this, let's get this tourist stuff out of the way that everybody does. And I'm kind of stressing out, because I'm like, it's taking me to different stops and like the Google Maps are really good at showing you which one to get on, but like, then the train, it says it's about to pull up and it says something a little bit different. I'm like, ah, I think this is it, let's get on. And then you get on and then you're like, ah. I'm like starting to panic. And I'm like, this is not the right one. And I'm like, oh, it's not the right one. And it's stopping at the first stop. And I'm like, uh, get off. I, I, we gotta get off. We gotta get off. And we were still like above ground at another platform. Uh -oh. And I'm like, this is, I looked at the map where we were then. I was like, yeah, we, we went the wrong direction. And now it's saying we gotta go and we can't just get on another train here. And I'm like in full panic mode. <laughs> like I am, I was at, I actually was like falling apart and I didn't realize it like I was panicking 
and I'm like, we we gotta get, get you know, cause getting on a train and then like making a split decision to get off and make sure that like all members of your family are there. Boy, I'm glad I didn't have the boys with me. Sure. I guarantee you at least one of them would have still be on that tube right now. <laughs> so we're on the platform. Good experience. And like, Christy's like, well, I think, I'm like, we listen, we gotta, we, 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 you gotta get on this, we gotta go down here, we gotta go on this platform, we gotta get on another train and we're going a totally different direction now because we, we and we're gonna be late and like, and she's like, why don't we just, you know, go up these stairs and we could just Uber. And I'm like, no, we can't, <laughs> I, we can't Uber. I've got this card. I've invested in an Oyster card. And I'm like, I'm not yelling at Christy, I'm yelling at London. Okay. Okay? Yep. I'm yelling at myself, I think is what was happening. I was just freaking out. And I was like, no, we, we have to, we, we can do this. And like, I can do this. I can, I can, I can navigate. <laughs> I can get us there. And it was. What was I, your daughter doing at this point? And she was like, she was trying to be helpful. She was looking on her phone and trying to figure out which train to get on because apparently this is very important to me. And I said, well, we can't take an Uber. You know, I, I am just, and I'm looking at the phone and like, I'm trying to figure it out and she's suggesting an alternate plan. And I'm like, I, I'm gonna throw this phone onto the tracks. And I like, at that point I locked eyes with Christy and I could tell that like, she could see that something was snapping, raw, snapping inside of me. And it was just like, then she was like, quiet. I looked at Lily and she like looked in my eyes and she was like quiet and I was like, let's get an Uber. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was interesting how, and then we, we get to the tower line and I'm thinking like, man, we got, I was like, I'm trying to explain myself and like, listen, it said it was gonna be a 20 minute subway ride or they don't use the word subway. And, or oh, that's like your problem. 30 minute Calling it the Uber. Wrong thing. And it was, you know, we'd already bought these and like the price and all this stuff and it's like all this stuff that doesn't matter. I was just trying to make myself, I was trying to explain myself and try to restore what I felt like was the hope that was lost in my girl's eyes. Did that you, I could lead us to the Tower of London, the place where queens were beheaded or whatever. Did you, I don't think that happened, did you? Um, oh, they beheaded grandmas, They behead, I took the tour, brother. They beheaded queens, though. Yeah, a king and a a king's mom. Did you? Uh, did, but did you make it on time? Did you miss your tour? Well, a, a tour leaves every thirty minutes. <laughs> okay. Right. So again, it's like it was. I, okay. I was freaking out over nothing, but it was like it was a bad Uber ride there. I will say that. Like it was. So this is like, day two. Yeah, yeah morning yeah. of day two. Yeah, can't have this kind of. You can't break. You can't fall apart on day two. Like we get out of the Uber and Christy's like, "We're, we're just gonna go get a coffee." I'm like, "Well, I'm gonna go get the tickets." And then like, I had some space, and I like, right? You know, it, I just needed a couple of minutes to realize that I was being a jackass. Well, you know, falling apart on day two actually, there is a different way to see that. Get it out of the way. As long as you don't fall, you don't fall out. You know, you don't again. freak out again. It was a, you know, we we did the tour. The tour was fun. Um, we saw the crown jewels in Iraq. Now I always thought that those were testicles. Yeah. They're not. You know, what do you think the rack is? I thought those was breasts. <laughs> <laughs> crown jewels are, you know, for. It's not the king's nuts. It's king's jewels. It's literally jewels, Rhett. It's not a euphemism for anything, oh. you dirty. I, no, I just. <laughs> yeah, oh, this is the family jewels. The family jewels. Yeah, That's... the crown jewels go in the crown. Yeah. And there's all these different crowns and scepters and I kinda, I wasn't that into it, but but um, you get on a. You don't like gems? I don't like gems. I don't like crowns, I don't like scepters. Wow. And there's a bunch of them and you like get on a moving platform and I walk gotta, past. You gotta take your birthday present you back. Stand, <laughs> you stand and be, you're like escalated down past them. But then you go to like where they would torture people and they had a rack in there and I'm like, this is down in like the, the castle barracks part. And I'm like, man, this is visceral. This is where it's at. There was one where they would, you would 
picture if you get down on your knees and your so your shins are on the ground and then you put your belly on top of your thighs and you like fold your whole self over like you're in the fetal position but on your shins. Sounds awesome. And then they put a rack over top of you that fits over the top of your back and and it comes together like this and then that part starts wrenching down and they just start wrenching you down like scrunching you down on yourself. So it's the opposite of a rack which like you know, pulls you apart, pulls your all your joints apart. And they did this to people, both of these. I just, uh, I've been to the torture museum in Prague. Oh gosh, I mean, I saw two apparati. I saw I, many. I, I, I'm not into that, man. I, I mean, I was into two, but I couldn't be into three. Uh, I like seeing, I like seeing the, the, you know, the lengths that human depravity can get to. <laughs> not because I'm interested in it, for myself, but because it's just to remind yourself of how screwed up people are. Well, if you would have seen me on that platform saying, I'm gonna th throw my phone onto the tracks. Like when we got back into the car after the tour of London, which I, you know, we had a good time, like the beef eaters take you on the tour and they're like very boisterous and they're funny. And so I was like, okay, this could be behind us. The rest of our day could be, you know, we got into another Uber and it was like, it was hard to find, hard to get into and we weren't going back on the tube. And then we were Ubering to Camden Market and it was like we couldn't we couldn't meet up with the Uber and like I'm, I'm starting to wig out again. And I realized that like I had all these expectations that you know we were gonna see all these things and everything was gonna go perfectly and everything was gonna go smoothly and it was up to me. Like Christy and Lily, they didn't, they never, put that on me, I put that on myself, but you know I'm just, I have this perfectionistic way of thinking that like was very self-destructive in that moment. And so when we were back in the Uber, I still couldn't, I, it was like I was back in that place again after the, the tour and like it was quiet and then Christy was, ba she like broke the ice and I was like, I was trying to explain myself again and I was just like, I thought I was gonna have a second breakdown. <laughs> it was just like, but I this time because I realized that I was carrying the, all this unnecessary weight of a perfect successful trip being on my shoulders that no one placed there except myself. So once I got over that, Camden Market was awesome because it was some really good food. Like you would love it there. You should go there. There's like a bunch of different food trucks and like all different combinations of, of foods. But um, that was my first moment of introspection. I think it's good to have a couple, which I did have a second one, which I'll tell you about after hearing about a little about Colorado, but uh, I made it through that. Well, <clears throat> I embarrassed myself as well. Um, oh, good. I, uh, I'm gonna tell you a little uh, a story that will, uh, you'll see the purpose in it. It's a little backstory. Okay. Um, so as I established weeks ago, um, I took the very douche baggish uh, step of getting custom ski boots made for myself. You told us all about those boots. And uh, you know, I have an unusually shaped foot. Uh, it's narrow, it's long, it's a high arch. There's uh, ski boots that you just get at the rental place. They just, you know, they can't handle my feet. Your arch is so high, it looks like it was put in one of those torture devices. Yeah, it might have been. I Which I think women call a high heel. I don't remember my early childhood. It's like your foot bent, um, bent over on itself. So I uh, I had these boots made and then I, when I went to Mammoth, uh, the trip that I talked about before, um, I actually ended up with a, quite a bit of pain in my heels, like the sides of my heels and specifically the right foot was very painful, the okay. outside of the right foot. Okay. So I go back to the place in Studio City, uh, Ski Net Sports, I, forget, I didn't know the name last time, but shout out to Claude, Ski Net Sports, he'll hook you up. Uh, but Willie? Yeah, well yeah, because here's what he does. You, you can never guarantee if a boot's gonna have a perfect fit until you go out and play around in it, you know? Ski in it, as they say. <laughs> and I, um, I go back and I tell him, I show him on my feet where it's hurting and then he takes this makeup, he, t he takes my socks, he says take your socks off, he doesn't do that for you. And then he puts makeup on your feet and you put them back in the boots and then he has you push your foot back into the back of the boot and then it basically 
you've pointed to where it hurts, he's put makeup on there, and then it shows inside the boot exactly where that spot is hurting. Oh. And it turns out you've got like a little, uh, he showed me a, 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 like a diagram of a, of a skeleton of the bones of the foot, and there's this little foot on, there's this little bone on the outside of your heel that juts out, and for a lot of people, that can be painful. And so he goes, takes the boot. I thought he was gonna like melt the boot and like move it around, but he actually just took a little sander thing and went in and like ground like down. Like a Dremel? Yeah, he, he ground it down. I could have done that. And uh, created a pocket for that bone on both feet. This is this is great. So I'm like so You're ready, set so now. ready to ski. As I'm leaving, I'm like, it's supposed to rain and veil. He said, well, you know what that means. I was like what well, he said, it won't, <laughs> because he was like the weather forecast always changes right okay. before you get there. He said, but just in case, take a couple of these, and he gives me this little, um, it's like a ring that looks like a little flipper, like a foot flipper. But he said it's a little windshield wiper for if it rains to wipe the rain off of your goggles. You got a a finger. Yeah, windshield wiper. He's like one for you and one for the lady, and I was like, well. I didn't tell him my wife wasn't gonna ski, but I was like, I'll take both of them, whatever. Okay, so so Jesse was not gonna ski. Jesse was like, she's like, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna go around and hang out in coffee shops, I'm gonna eat, whatever, I'm gonna have a great time. Okay. And But me and Locke and Shepard were going to ski the whole time. Like, we were there for seven days, we were gonna ski for six, we were like one day off. First day, it had snowed a bunch the week before, but it was perfectly sunny, Claude was right. The forecast changed, no rain in the forecast, except for to the last day, basically a week of sun. Okay. You haven't skied in Colorado at nope, all, right? never. You, you, you've done Park City, which is an incredible resort, so you've kind of experienced that, uh, but it was also, there was like a blizzard when we skied. To ski in Colorado on a big, they have a, the, one of the best years they've ever had in Vail, there's like a 400 inch base, and it's sunny, away from me. Apparently he's not in the mood for a close up. Missed opportunity, buddy. It was absolutely incredible. I mean, there were there were moments where I was just like I don't do like the crazy double black diamonds or anything. You know, I'm like a blue man, the blue man group, and I just kind of take it you like easy. You like making things into a percussion. Yeah. And I just kind of keep it easy and I just carve and I just I I, I like to get not too fast cuz I don't want to hurt myself. Yeah. I'm just having is, a great time. This is not an airport. And uh, I'm, I mean, I'm having so much fun, and there's, it's, it's so expansive. But about you know an hour and a half into skiing, my heel starts hurting. I'm like, yeah, man, I, Claude. I had a feeling that Claude had not quite gotten it. Sean Claude Van. He had not quite dremeled out enough of that. You know, I, I could have made a bigger hole for my big old bone. <laughs> okay, but he didn't, and so. I'm hurting a little bit, but you know what? I'm like, you know what? You know, maybe you gotta break them in a little bit. Maybe that's what you gotta do. Maybe you gotta break the boots in a little bit once they get adjusted. Well, lunch rolls around and we decide to meet Jesse at a restaurant. Cause one of the, I mean, first of all, hi, highly recommend Vail. I'll tell you the only reason I don't recommend Vail and I'll get into a story later that illustrates this, it's too expensive. It's just, they have you trapped there. They charge you too much for everything, but it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the village, basically, you, t you you ski right down to the village, and you just like put your skis up, and then you just walk to a restaurant, meet your wife who doesn't have skis on. You can walk in your ski boots. Well, I can, because <laughs> they're custom. Uh, no, yeah, anybody can walk in their ski boots. I mean, it's awkward, but yeah, yeah. But but Cl Claude told me he said you keep these strapped down the whole day. You don't have to, you know, with rental boots. A lot of times you have to let them loose before, while yeah. you walk around. He said these should fit so tight and so perfectly, you just keep them down the whole day. So I'm trying to do that, you know, I wanna be a purist, I wanna do what the guy tells me to do. But as I walk into the restaurant, I'm like, my foot is hurting, my heel is hurting me. Maybe, maybe, dare I say, worse than it did the first time before he made the adjustments. Okay. And I uh, sit down, we have lunch at this restaurant. I, I have to take my boot off, because it's hurting so bad. Mm. Take it off. Now is that? Admitting defeat? Did you feel like less of a man? At that point, I was like. like that's is your version of taking the Uber. At this point, I was like, I'm gonna have to call Claude. I'm gonna have to tell him he didn't get it. He didn't get it right. I'm gonna have to rent boots for the rest of the week, nullifying my whole purchase. You were gonna call him and say, "Screw you." No, no, I was gonna call him and say, "Dude, I got to get these adjusted when I get back because it didn't work." 
Okay. But I put it back on, I said, I'm gonna ski the rest of the afternoon. I get back out there, I also. You took it off, you didn't see anything wrong with it. I no. thought you were gonna say he left a Dremel in there. No. I take it off, nothing. I mean, I take it off and my foot instantly feels better. I put it back in there, I'm like, okay, well, maybe, yeah, this is good. I, I'll get, let me get it tight. Maybe it's just, I need, maybe it just needs to be tighter. Because he told me it's gotta be tight. You gotta get that thing tight in there. Because I got it perfect. And so okay. I get it super tight. We ski a little bit more. I'm having the time of my life. Let me just tell you, I took a little pain reliever just to preemptively deal with the pain. Yeah, yeah. But we get down, we, we've got to ski across the mountain to get back to where we were staying. To kind of the, the slopes closed pretty early there, around four o'clock. Uh, and so we were gonna like come about 3.30 and come into the, to our, you, you literally, I mean, talk about being a douche. I mean, you ski directly down the hill and you ski to the valet guy for your hotel and you just give him your skis and you walk and he has hot chocolate and then you walk into your hotel. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's all right there. It's unbelievable. It's the douchiest thing you could possibly imagine. And there's douches everywhere. Everywhere. Everywhere, you everywhere right you look, in. a douche. It's like looking in a mirror. <laughs> I mean, people who ski in Vail, this is as douchey as it gets, man, as far as I've ever been around. Yeah, yeah, you're loving it. And uh, so I- I couldn't do it. I, I, uh, we're skiing back to, you know, this is a big mountain, so we've got a lot of skiing to do. And I get to a place where I'm like, my foot is hurting me so bad, I, but I can't show, I can't reveal how much pain I'm in to my boys. I gotta, I gotta be the dad. I gotta, I gotta hold this in. Yeah. But there was a couple of times where we stopped, where I would have to stop and like wait on Shepard because he was still kind of getting his legs. And I would stop and it would, the pain would just like shoot from my heel all the way up my leg and I would go, oh, oh and like it would be a moment of, oh, oh, like crying out like that. And then I Your started- Your eyes crossed? Then I started thinking, I may, I may start crying. I'm in so much pain. Like I haven't <laughs> cried from pain since I was a child. <laughs> really? But like my eyes were water. I was like, oh god! And then Lot was like, Dad, do we need to get, do we need to get help? <laughs> and I'm like, No, son. Your dad's gonna make it to the bottom of the mountain. Your dad is a super <laughs> douche. His super tight fitted custom boots, which don't amount to a amount, amount of crap. Your dad will not be out douched by any of the other douches around here. Your dad is the douchiest dad. <laughs> he's gonna cry. He's gonna get. But he's gonna keep skiing all the way to his valet and with, get that. He's gonna grab that hot chocolate. With tears in his, with his eyes. Tears in his eyes. <laughs> so, and he's gonna retrieve his testicles kept down at the base of the mountain. I make it to the bottom of the mountain and I'm in intense pain. I get my hot chocolate, which makes me feel a little bit better. I walk back to my room. I, my wife is still out and about doing whatever she wants. I take off my boot and that link is when, the I don't end know of why, your story. I did not know why I didn't realize it before but the little windshield wiper that he had given me was in the bottom of my no boot. No way! <laughs> and I have. Even even when I said like, no. I thought that you were yeah, yeah, looking yeah. for something at the restaurant. This was in the bottom oh of my boot. Oh my gosh. And let me show you what my foot looked like. Oh, <laughs> what? It was, okay. You paid so much money for custom fitted boots and then you put a, <laughs> you put a plastic, Windshield wiper <laughs> directly <laughs> under your heel. Now you may think to yourself, how, how could you? How could you not feel that there was something under it? Yeah. And something about the shape of this, the fact that it was perfectly situated in the bottom of my heel, the fact that it has absolutely no edge on one side, and then it is a perfect circle, and the fact that I had experienced almost the exact same type of pain before, all these factors led me to never consider that maybe the freaking Skeegee, they call it. That's funny. Squeegee, skeegee is the thing that was sending so much pain into my body. And it's weird how, like, it, it was literally sending it directly up your heel. It right? was crazy. And like, the, and, and the, that's like a an acupuncture type situation. Like, and, and the fact that I made the decision early on to be like, you know what? It needs to be tighter. <laughs> like, that was when you the ratcheted pain, it down. Let me tell you, the rest of the trip, when I didn't have that thing in my boot, Claude, 
Shout out to you, brother. You made my feet feel incredible. I mean, you shouldn't have given me that ski G because I put it in my boot. That was my fault. But the repairs you made to my boots were on point. I don't need any adjustments. I'm so happy. This is the douchiest boots I've ever had. This is one happy douche. But and so that was day one. That was day one. I'm glad okay. I got that out of the way. Wow. What if What if you'd have realized it at the end of the trip? That'd have been horrible. <laughs> well, it would have been difficult to do because uh, I did look in my boot. You yeah. know, I didn't look at it in the restaurant because I kind of I, I didn't even want to draw attention to the fact oh, that I was you, taking see, my boot off. You were, you were too concerned about your rep. I was like, you I, didn't want all the other douches to know that well, you were weaker. Nobody else in the restaurant had their boots on at all. Oh, nobody really? was even. Ski- I felt you know. Oh really? Anyway, I had a, the skiing ended up being an incredible part of the trip. I did yell at my children a little bit just to kind of join the club. It's interesting that you're, I mean, you're the one who likes variety and doesn't like to go back and do the same thing. Like I thought you may be like, man, I got a, this skiing thing's getting old. I wanna experience something different. Well, Like are you doubling down on the skiing now? No, at the end of the trip, my conclusion, and I like to have a feeling and to sort of distill a feeling at the end of the trip yeah. and then kind of like remember that because yeah. you'll forget about it. It's just like when you have a child. After you have a child, you're like, I'm never doing that again and then it wears off and you have more kids. Yeah, you didn't distill it enough. You gotta distill it. Distilled at the end of the vacation, I was like, that was super fun, but a couple of things. I feel like I narrowly avoided getting seriously hurt. Like just statistically speaking, there was so much skiing involved for me and my two sons hmm. that the fact that none of us got hurt, I kind of feel like we got lucky because there was people getting on our plane in wheelchairs and they were like, had been recently injured. Wow. Uh, during their time in Vail. And also, yeah, you do kind of feel like, I've kind of been down this trail, I and because I'm not some super risk taker and I don't like jump off of cliffs, my skiing experience sort of maxes out with a certain thing and, and so, uh, and also Jesse didn't do it with us and so I kind of felt like I wasn't really spending that much time with her so I thought, you know what? So you're saying this phase is coming to an end? No, no, no. I, no, I think that the weekend ski trip, the yeah. two day, the yeah. three day ski trip, but a full week of skiing in one place, we're not gonna do it next year, we're gonna do something else and then we'll decide as a family if we wanna go back and do it again. I, it w- had an incredible time and the, and the kids, one of the things about doing that much skiing back to back is like, the learning curve, like the kids are so much better. Like we, we're, we're like, Shepard like can keep up with with us perfectly now because he just did so much skiing. Well, I, you know, I agree that you should distill down your trip. I think for me as it relates to the trip, you know, I had all the expectations of what the perfect trip would look like from an itinerary standpoint. Uh, on the fifth day we went to Stonehenge and Bath uh, and then j- just to give you a complete view of what my trip was, I do recommend going to Stonehenge. I know you're into, it's not wood, but you're also into rocks and yeah, you're stones. into like 5,000 year old rock configurations. Um, very cool. Bath was okay. Tastes like bad pipes. Um, it was cool to walk around, but I really love Stonehenge. But as as far as like distilling it down, I also think I had a lot of expectations. I got really excited the months back when I said this is gonna be like Sweet 16, Lily trip. It's good. You know, I, I don't know what I pictured specifically, but I, I will be honest, um, and this is not a criticism of, of Lily, in any way, I think it's it's more of just my internal dialogue that I don't know. I I felt like there was going to be some magical sweet sixteen moment that I found myself questioning: Should I have done something more ceremonial? Like when we went to Bath, and we it's Bath is the only naturally occurring hot springs in the UK in that one town, and they built a whole you know like town around it. You'd like people would come for for forever and just drink from the springs and they started bathing in it. But you know, I was like, maybe I should do some sort of sweet 16 ceremony here or I'm something. I'm sure that would something. go over well. Yeah, yeah, and it's like, you know, that was not my instinct at the time, but then when it was done, when we were coming back, I was like, was it, could it, could it have been even more special? You know, I think I was thinking, I don't know that, 
there would all of a sudden our in, the 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 structure or like the tone of our entire relationship would shift. Like I I in in I I ultimately chalked it up to me having these nebulous but huge and unrooted expectations of some magical event happening where oh look my daughter is a woman now and <laughs> I guess that's not the right way to say it. <laughs> but like it was that we'd have this special moment. Like there were remember that one moment when she turned to me and her mom and said, you know what, you're the greatest parents on earth and I am so, I just feel like I'm having the, the most special moment of my life right now and I'm glad that I'm sharing it with you and not with some two-bit boyfriend who wants to take me to some knockoff prom situation. Knockoff prom? I don't know, I'm just. What is that? There is no. There is no two-bit boyfriend, and there's no knockoff prom. I'm just saying, like, you know, as your as your kids get older, at least for me, I I want to know that like I have a vibrant and special relationship as it evolves. Because make no mistake, it is evolving. I mean, she's becoming an adult, so it's not a parent-child relationship exclusively. Now it's like a there's a there's a friend component. They're starting to have conversations that you would have with any other adult and seeing her rise to that occasion conversationally and say, oh yeah, she's, I'm seeing my daughter differently as a more mature person who's becoming her own complete adult, you know? That's really starting to happen at this point in an emotional and relational level. But I apparently had some sort of expectation that there would be a magical moment. That only happens in the movies, man. And, and that happens on television. And if you that and, doesn't happen in real and life. And to your point, if you tried to like ceremonialize it, it could go very sideways. It could be very awkward. It you can't. So I kind of swung the pendulum uh, upon further reflection that if I would have tried to create some sort of ceremonial moment, like manufacture it or engineer it, that the chances of that backfiring into awkwardness and just seeming forced, there's a high likelihood of that. So I, I think my takeaway, it having been a while since um, the trip, is just an appreciation that we did the trip. I think as more time passes, it will actually grow to be even more special. That's my theory at least, that you take the whole time as a whole and it, it's not, you know, the picture that we took in front of Westminster Abbey when it started hailing on us, maybe that'll be a great memory too. I think it will be. But it's coming back after going to the Harry Potter uh, tour all day and riding in some huge freaking torturous bus for like an a over an hour to get to this place and to come back and then just crashing at our at our room and saying, you know what, let's just watch something. And she's like, let's watch um, the Umbrella, let's see, what's it called? Umbrella Academy. It's this like series on on Netflix that she's into. She's like, I've already watched it, but I wanna watch it with you guys. So it's like all three of us piling into our bed and watching a Netflix series together. And I think those are the things that I'm gonna remember. It's like, we hung out like friends and it was, it was special and even, yeah, I, they may remember me having the breakdown or they, you know, and I think we'll be able to laugh about those type of things, but I think it's- It's an investment, man. It's an investment in setting an environment where we can have an experience together so that the weird, the frustrating, the tired, the and the special all kind of meld together and create something that I believe is unforgettable but doesn't translate into something you can just buy in a souvenir shop it, and, and remember. It's in that not way. like something. It's like try, it's like investing into your retirement fund and then like going back the next day and like looking at it and being like, oh, oh, I, when is this? When is this going to grow? I think that's right because I mean, and I also think from her, I, from her perspective, it's not like I expected her to articulate things that kids as don't a do sixteen that. year old she has no point of reference. It's like. 
You know, I didn't want to go into the selection mode. Like, not every 16 year old gets to go anywhere they want in the world, and you get to go to London and, like, don't forget what we've done for you. It's like, I actually, I was tempted to go into that a few times. Well, but you should do that from, t- from time to time, just as, as to be a good dad. Not that she wasn't grateful or uh, appreciative because um, she was, but. You just have to hope that when the kids write the tell all book, uh huh, that the good outweighs the bad, man. And the best you can hope for is that you're gonna get like a card. Like, okay, realistically, you're gonna get like a card when they're 33. Okay. And they've got some life experience. And then they're like, they write you a really sweet card. And they're like, I remember that trip. And I've really thought about how you cared about us and the time that you put into our relationship. But you're not gonna, unless you've got an exceptionally, exceptional, unusual, expressive child, Mm -hmm. they're not gonna be like, I wanna let you know that this vacation is going incredibly well and I recognize Right, that you guys have actually thought about this in a way that, you know, this is just, I realize this is just for me. Like you guys made a decision to leave the other kids at home to just bring me here to do the things that I wanted to do, to create a memory for me? That would- You guys are the best parents in the world. Yeah, that's what I wanted and that would be weird, wouldn't it? You don't want want that because then it's about you. Mm, Isn't that true? It's not about you. It's about the investment that you're making in your daughter and in your family, and That's then you, right. you got to hope that not only is it. First of all, you don't do it just for the card or for the the tell all book to be good versus bad. You're doing it because you actually think it's contributing to her as a person. And how can she know? How could she even process? Like I can at my age, I can barely process the the way that the my experiences are impacting who I am. Yeah, you take me for granted all the time. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, well, no, I mean, I deal with the same things with my kids. It was like, I mean, I now I do on a regular basis and I also think that generalization here, but uh, uh, dealing with two boys is a little bit, it's a little bit different. And I, uh, I mean, they're like constantly fighting and like constantly annoying each other. And we had to like, there were multiple times where I'm just like go, 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 going to that kind of dad mode, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then have to pull myself back. But, you know, you talk about you guys getting together. One of the most special things that we experienced on our trip was, okay, so every day, the three of us would go out and ski. There would be multiple fights between Locke and Shepard because Locke's getting mad that Shepard's holding them up, holding us up and he's, you know, he falls down and then he needs help and other people have to help him if I'm below him on the mountain and stuff. And then Locke would be like, I'm gonna ski by myself. And so he goes off and does his teenage ski by himself thing and then Shepard and I ski and then we'll meet up again. You about to do that? You gonna come down that? Nothing. So that kind of thing is happening. I'm kind of trying to manage it and I'm not trying to force it because I want the same thing. I want there to be these moments of like a father and his two sons in perfect rhythm on the slopes of Colorado. Yeah. Postcard. Yeah. But really it's And like, while they're skiing, they're looking at you talking about how great of a dad you are. Yeah, right. But really the, what's happening is I'm getting separated from Shepard and I'm getting a phone call from Jesse who got a phone call from the guy at the lift who's like, your son is here and is lost. That happened, yeah, it's not even worth it. <laughs> Shepard or Locke? Shepard. Locke had his own phone. Uh, but Shepard was fine, he didn't panic or anything. He knew that he would get in touch when we got we, we got hooked back up. And also, in the midst of looking for Shepard, cutting off this little girl, then her dad come skiing up to me and he's like, what the hell are you thinking? And me not saying anything back to him because I didn't have an answer. There's uh, something in my boot. <laughs> No, that was after the boot had been There was cleared. something in my boot yesterday. But the cool, one of the best things that happened as a family is we would go skiing and then we would come back and we would go out to eat. And then we would come back to the hotel and they had our, their room and we had our room. Uh, but we would all get into our bed. So four of us, which is even more difficult <laughs> than three people in a bed. 
and we would watch the Goldbergs. Now I know I, I have told you, I've already plugged the Goldbergs once. But you we, plugging some Goldbergs. That was your show. And again, I let me just say that I'm not saying that it's a perfect show. I'm saying it is the perfect show to watch as a, as our family because we all fit these totally exaggerated tropes on the show is so exaggerated. Well, not really. I mean, well, it's you, you don't have to go back through why the Goldbergs is great, but no, what, but what did we, it do for you? No, guys? but like we relate. There's something about all this stuff that we've done during the day of like Locke being the typical teenager and Shepard being the typical annoying little brother and Jesse being the overprotective mom and me being the dad with a short fuse. Uh -huh. That when you sit down and you see it played out comedically in a show, it just we start realizing how we've just fallen into these roles in these predictable ways, and it just makes us we bonded as a family. And then it's like Shepard, it would be like ten o'clock at night, and I, Shepard figured out how to call room to room, of course. So we started doing that a lot. And the phone would ring, I pick it up and be like, "Hello," and Shepard would be like, "You know what time it is?" I was like, "What?" He said, "Goldberg time." <laughs> and so he was like, he was so into us good. sitting down. And there's not a kind of like, like our Survivor time. And there's yeah, there's not a like you've said before. There's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of entertainment out there that you can just sit down as a family and just completely bond. That used to be the way it was. Yeah. Ironically, back in the 80s, which is when the Goldbergs is based, but um, that was the sweetest time that we had. Like lots of typical family stuff that we did of getting on each other's nerves, but there was that time we would all get together, all file into the bed, and just, I think that that's the kind of thing that they're gonna remember. Yeah. They're gonna, they're gonna have a memory of like, I remember being, you don't remember being annoyed by your little brother or your big brother or your your dad having a short fuse or your mom getting, you know, picking at something on you and getting, you know, upsetting you. I think you'll, you'll remember those, the sweet times. And if they don't, we can make them listen to this podcast. Um, do you have anything else from London? No, that's it, man. Uh, we get, ride, the, we rode the double decker bus. Christy liked that a lot better than the tube. A lot more visibility. Everybody was happy on once, top. We, once we got up top of the double decker bus. Uh, I have a quick wreck that I think you're gonna be you're gonna wholeheartedly check, a, baby, agree check, with. Baby one two three four. Check baby I check do, baby one two. Just as a small addendum, because I can't not tell you this. In the little shop in Vale, is this the, a wreck? The little I, this is I'm you leaving, tease the I'm, wreck. I'm teasing the wreck. Okay. In the little shop in Vale in Vale Village, well in Vale Village, there's a bunch of shops and there's a bunch of like really like rich folk stuff, right? Boutique, they called us boutiques. And we went into this one store called Gorsuch, which I just thought that he was the guy that Obama tried to get to be the Supreme Neil Court Gorsuch. nominee. It didn't yeah. work out too well. Um, but apparently it's a brand or it's a store. And you could kind of tell from the window that this was like douche central. And so we're like, so let's you go. Were, you were like a moth to a flame. Well, here's the thing. I'll get custom ski boots, but I don't go in and buy unnecessarily expensive clothing. I I don't I don't do like that. Like a vest with like skiers on it. I don't do that. So we go into this place. Well, you went in for entertainment purposes. I'm not going to buy anything. I'm going in there because I'm blown away at the culture and like the vibe and it's three stories. I think the collars won't unpop there. We go in there. And you walk in, the first level is the women's level. Okay. And there was this coat that was like a, like a, like a cardigan of some kind, but a little bit longer. I think that's just a coat. Nothing special. Looks like something from the rack of Forever 21. Okay. Price tag. $2,000. Three thousand nine hundred and ninety-eight dollars. Four thousand dollars. And I was like, what? And I was like, I'm gonna be in here a while because this is so entertaining to me. To and there's people actually shopping and trying things on. I go upstairs to the men's section, and that was when. And I'd already kind of picked up on this. There's a bunch of Italian people, lots of people from Europe, lots of people speak, speaking Spanish and Italian. Okay, but lots of Italian people who apparently have lots Money. of discretionary cash. Getting that Italian leather. And um, this dude is trying on this puffy jacket in front of his girlfriend. How do I look? But he said it in Italian. And uh, she was like. But you knew that's what he was saying. She was like, 
Bonjour. Bonito. Well, oh, I don't know what it was. French. What is the, I don't know. She said it looked good. And then I went and I picked one up. Oh, you kind of on the sly looked at $2,000. It was just a puffy jacket. This dude was about to buy it. God. I mean, this, this place. Welcome to your future. But here's the Listen, thing. Listen, man, all right, so this you're on place, record saying you would never do this because no, you're on a slippery no, slope no, no. with your hot chocolate. Well, hold on, no. First of all, I ski boots cost what ski boots cost, right? Okay. In the long run, I'm actually gonna save money because you have to rent them every time you go. Okay. But the thing I told Jesse is I was like, I don't. You know me, I'm a tightwad, man. I'm like, I bought the Oyster card. It's got $5 on it, I can't Uber. So right. I, but, but no, but let's just say you had unlimited money. Like it, money was not an object, which is the saying, which I never understood what exactly that means literally, but money is no obstacle to you, right? Yeah. You wouldn't buy that. If I had no. all the money in the world, I would not buy a $4,000 jacket. I wouldn't buy if a $2,000. If it did something. It doesn't do anything else. If it else. did something very special, like told the future, then you'd probably buy it. But I mean, you're not just gonna buy one that doesn't tell the future. But apparently this stuff is so expensive that Americans can't even buy it. You gotta be Italian. Oh. You gotta be rich and from another country. You know what I'm saying? Like, because I was the only American that ventured into this particular show. Maybe, to, maybe the dollar conversion is confusing. And there's, <laughs> and there's something about Italians doing it that makes it seem not douchey. They can do anything. You know what I'm saying? It's like he's kind of making himself seem humble in that two thousand, <laughs> yeah, that two thousand dollar jacket. Oh yeah, they, I can never get away with that. Every time they get in the car, they're magically driving on an undulating highway on the coast. Right, like that's how Italians roll. It, I don't understand where like the money comes every from. Every road, it's like Italian royalty, but that's not a thing because it's not a monarchy. I don't know where it comes from. Pasta money, that's what it is. They just they just churn it out like pasta. Yeah, they just extrude money. So anyway, like bow tie. Shout out to pasta. the non douchey very rich Italians of Vale. May your four thousand dollar jackets keep you warm at night. What's your recommendation, man? Uh, my recommendation is a song that. Actually, you played for me. Uh, for, uh, I do want to say quickly that you going to recommend. I made a, song. a recommendation, a musical recommendation that we had to cut out because the person I recommended said something problematic. So I'm not, and I already said that on Twitter. You're talking but about I, Cardi B? No, it wasn't Cardi B. Uh, it was it was a lesser, very lesser known you're person. Talking about Michael? Jackson? Do, 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 do. No, do, now you're just saying things. It was somebody that you probably so didn't know about. Controversial artist. No, and I'm saying that. Me mentioning them to like 90% of you would be your first time you'd ever heard this person's name and then you'd look them up and you'd see that the thing they're in the news for now is something problematic. So, so you're about that's to, why we took the wreck out. You're about to make the same mistake again? No, I'm giving you like a very non-problematic music Don't wreck. wreck the same guy. Um, this is not a guy, this is a group and this is a group that my son and I bonded over because I played this particular song and I feel like I opened up a world to my son and he actually ended up texting me today about this whole movement of music that I, we talked about. And that is Make It With You by Bread. <clears throat> Which I think is a, is oh, it, I, love this I think is a, is on the post concert playlist yeah. that you put together. Yeah, uh, I, I've been big you, on this song for a while cause now, matter of fact it played, Spotify played it in the car the other day and Lily was like, you play this song a lot. So she didn't seem to love Bread. Okay well. My boy is in it. And uh, so Make It With You by Bread. Bread is this soft rock band that, I think that song's from like 73 or 74, but early 70s, almost as a hey, rebellion ha against. Have you ever tried really reaching out for the other side? As a, as a rebellion against the, the sort of the disco movement that yeah. was happening, these guys were doing something. They were just pouring out their music like syrup. Well they were climbing on rainbows. It was absolutely amazing. In this song, dare I say, there are no perfect songs, but if you had to put songs into closest to perfect as it can possibly be, Make It With You by Bread is a as close to perfect song as there is. Oh man, those are strong words. I think it's- And l listen to it with your air phones on. Your ear biscuits. It's like summer breeze, but a little less douchey. So it's not like, it's like the Italian summer breeze. It's like the Italian summer breeze. Yeah, yeah right. I agree with that. It's like putting on a four thousand dollar jacket, then realizing that oh, I didn't even pay for this. All right, guys, we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. Thanks for um, going with us on a journey back through our experiences over spring break. 
Vote for us for the Webby if you want to. Leave a, or leave a, if it's past that and you're listening to this in the distant future, you can still leave a review on iTunes if that still happens. If that still exists in the future. How far in the future are you listening to this? I don't know. I'm glad, I'm glad it's still in the ether. Somebody's listening to this in 2031. Our, gr- our great grandchildren. 2031's not, hopefully we won't have great grandchildren by then. Well. I I'm, mean, it might be biologically possible, but it would be controversial to say the least. That's only 12 years from now. That's a good point. (laughs) To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.